And now we begin the second installment of Concordia's conversation series, a series of conversations with policy leaders, leaders of the public sector, leaders of the private sector, coming together to talk about collaboration, foreign policy, national security policy, among other issues. Uh, joining me today is Fran Townsend, who is one of the very first members of Concordia's Leadership Council. Also uh, participated in the 2011 summit by interviewing mm -hmm. President George W. Bush. Uh, Fran, it's an honor to have you and thank you for being here today. Good to be here. I want to start very specifically uh, with a conversation shifting to national security issues. Um, given your role as former Homeland Security Advisor to President George W. Bush, uh, I want to start with uh, a comment made by Michael Morell, the former director, uh, deputy director of the CIA, who just released his first book, uh, The Great War of Our Time. He said that the best way to counter violent extremism was to go after the hearts and minds of the affected populations. Um, I wanted to get your, your comments on that. What do you think a blueprint for that sort of strategy would look like? So, it, I, Matt, I, I think it falls into sort of several distinct pieces. Um, first, what we've come to understand is ISIS, violent extremists around the world, have figured out that they can be a threat to the United States without ever crossing our borders. That's different than Al Qaeda in a, the era of 9-11. And so the way they do that is using the internet, which has been a force for good in our economy and the United, throughout the United States and the world. And they've turned that against us. And so we have to understand that we have to deny bad guys, extremists, the battlefield that is the internet. That's very difficult. We prize, we rightly prize our constitutional right to freedom of speech. Um, we're uncomfortable, inherently uncomfortable, limiting that in any way. But there's no place, even in a free internet and a free society, for beheading videos, for videos that are threatening. Just like we've moved to take bullies off the internet and deny them child pornography on the internet, we have to move to deny ISIS and extremists the internet. The second piece to that is you've got to fill that gap with something. Um, you know, multiple administrations have tried to counter the narrative, as we call it. That is, offer a different, more hopeful view of the world than one of death and destruction and oppression that ISIS and extremists uh, put out there. The problem is we, we in the West, um, the United States government, the State Department and others, don't really have a credible voice in that world. And I, what I think we need to do is empower those who do have credibility. Um, there's the group in London, for example, Not In My Name, mm -hmm. um, Quilliam, also London-based. There are moderate Muslims, that is, religious, respectful, observant Muslims, uh, who don't believe that this sort of violence and the advocating of this sort of violence is in the true name of Islam. We have to get comfortable with, we've got to fund them and support them, but we can't control their message. We have to trust them, mm -hmm. um, identify the right voices, and then empower and fund and entrust them to counter the narrative. Now, when you were Homeland Security Advisor, obviously a lot of social media was well underway, and so it, it must have played some role in, in your job, how you were um, looking at situations, how you were looking at the communications, how you were looking at potential recruitment from these extremist groups. Obviously, it seems to be much more severe, much more serious today. And mm -hmm. ISIS seems to be particularly skilled in, in this. Could you comment on that? And, and, and if you were Homeland Security Advisor today, how would that shift? How, what would be the change between today versus when you were uh, in the administration? Sure. You know, when I was in the administration, what we worried about was Anwar al-Awlaki, the Yemeni mm -hmm. preacher. He's now been killed. Um, but he was a very sort of firebrand, charismatic preacher. And his, his sermons were distributed first on audio tape and then by the internet. You could go on his website and get access to it. Um, and we watched very carefully, but it was not, it, it was sort of point to point. You could watch a website and watch people, watch what was going on in terms of who was accessing it. Um, it was more difficult to pass it around. Mm -hmm. Now it's ubiquitous, right? You can, you can blast it into the United States using social media. Yeah. Um, it's much more easy for them. Th their distribution mechanism is much, l has much less friction in it than it did when I was in the, in the White House. Um, there's no question. Look, surveillance plays an important role here. Um, and we've seen restrictions now on, on the surveillance capability, which obviously concern me. Mm -hmm. um, but it really is a question, what you're trying to do is only target the worst of the worst. 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the beheading videos and things like that. Um, and there are going to be people who preach a version of Islam that is distasteful to us, that we disagree with. But as we understand with the First Amendment, that's not what you're trying to prevent. What you're yeah. trying to prevent is really things that are not protected by the First Amendment. Now, you were at Department of Justice prior to being in the White House. Um, where does the law at this point sit? It seems that um, in the space of cyber, cyber security, um, protection, this is, this is the issue of this generation, it mm -hmm. seems. And the law consistently seems to be behind. Um, what do you see today? What do you see? Are there positive advancements that you see, or are there? Uh, do you see us having a long way to go in this process? Look, I think we have a long way to go. It, it's both a technological problem and a policy problem. Um, you, we've heard Dir FBI Director Jim Comey talk about the problem of encryption. Um, law enforcement authorities with legal process, right, so under the law, unable to get access, authorized access to communications because they can't break the encryption mm -hmm. or they can't get it in a timely way. Um, the other piece is trust. The, both the American people and the tech industry felt very betrayed when they realized that, I think it's Eric Schmidt who's talked about a front door and a back door. Um, I think th there needs to be a reestablishment of a real transparent dialogue between the government and industry. Uh, and frankly, if you can get timely access, maybe we no longer need a back door with U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, companies, that we can work cooperatively with due process of law um, and the necessary oversight that I think the government is more than willing to, to withstand. Um, but we need a, re a whole restructuring of that relationship between the government and industry. So taking what happened in Tennessee, um, obviously a, a, a horrible situation of a young guy who, whose neighbors seemed to be totally stunned that mm -hmm. he was capable of uh, killing four uh, individuals as he did, um, but uh, essentially was uh, indoctrinated, was engaged in uh, sort of extremist thought, uh, how do you prevent something like that at this point? I know they've added security at all of these army recruiting stations and locations, but at what point, uh, what's, what's the next step here? Sure. Well, look, we tragically lost the four Marines and one uh, Navy, Navy uh, enlisted uh, sailor, and that's a tragedy. But we've got to put it in context, right? That's a whole lot different than nearly 3,000 Americans on 9-11. And so the most positive thing to come out of it is we can say we've gotten better at preventing the mass casualty attacks. They require more people, more training, mm -hmm. more planning, more communications. And so over the years, we've gotten better at, at disrupting and preventing those. The tragedy is one individual with a gun um, who is either inspired, uh, troubled. It's not clear yet what was going on here with mm -hmm. this young man. We believe that he had an alcohol problem and a drug addiction problem. We know he traveled to the Middle East. The investigation is ongoing about who he met with and what their agenda was. Mm -hmm. uh, were they trying to radicalize him? But it's not clear. And, you know, even with a mentally deranged person like the shooter in Aurora, Colorado, who was recently convicted, very difficult to identify that one person before they act. That's where we, that's what comes in there. The only real hope there is community activism and community policing. Um, we've got to empower our communities to identify those who, are, who seem to be behaving oddly or strangely, out of character. See something, say something. Exactly. New York has got that very famous program that's mm -hmm. been adopted by the Department of Homeland Security. The idea is we all have a certain responsibility to identify threats before they manifest themselves in our communities. Let's talk a little bit on the national security debate. It's uh, the presidential field is ramping up. Uh, the political season is very much getting started. It seems that national security issues has become a lot more political than it used to be. Do you find that, and, and, and what do you see as sort of the dangers of that? You know, immediately post 9-11, we saw members of Congress standing on the steps uh, down in Washington singing the national anthem, singing God Bless America. Um, and the further we've gotten from those, the immediate aftermath of that tragedy, the more polarized it's become. Um, a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, I think that some of that's got to do with uh, Snowden's uh, mm -hmm. treasonous leaks. I think some of it's got to do with the, this debate over surveillance. 
enhanced interrogation techniques. Policy has become politicized. Um, average public servants at the CIA and FBI get caught in the mix of that during oversight hearings, and it's really unfair. They think they're following the rules that they've been given, um, and they find themselves caught up mm -hmm. in this political debate. Um, nothing could be more dangerous for the country. I, I worry about, the two things I really worry about is complacency, that is people thinking that the threat is not, because nothing has blown up here. Um, the threat is not as serious. I think the threat is as serious as it was pre-9-11, frankly, uh, from groups like ISIS. And the other is the politicization. That is, you know, more and more and more frequently, you, we see this partisan debate mm -hmm. where it's not just an honest debate about approaches. That is, we're strengthened by that. Um, this is a sort of a, a suggestion mm -hmm. um, that people are playing for personal agendas, party agendas, um, and that's not helpful. Um, I think it's very important, you know, we see that manifest itself in something like cyber legislation, which Congress after Congress has been unable uh, to pass. And we look at something like the Sony attack or the attack at Saudi Aramco destroying mm -hmm. tens of thousands of hard drives. The economic damage of a, of a cyber Pearl Harbor, if you will, um, would be devastating. Um, we could lose billions and trillions of dollars. I mean, frankly, I've called on Congress to create a cyber commission before mm -hmm. the cyber Pearl Harbor happens so we can work and have it be a bipartisan effort so that we can have a sort of look at what are the pro what the priorities should be and what the rules of the road should be to prevent a cyber Pearl Harbor from happening before it happens, not it, not looking at it afterwards. I think a lot of the peop peop a lot of people that look at what Edward Snowden did, um, I don't think there's any question to the damage that he caused. Mm -hmm. But what does it say about the institution, the way things are run, the way things, the way information is protected, that this young contractor was able to access so much information. I think that's a big point of frustration for a lot of people is saying, well, how on earth did he have access to this information in the first place? Right. Look, it, you know, it, you, you'd like to think that we learn from our mistakes, but a sergeant out in theater downloads information and gives it to Julian Assange. Edward Snowden downloads tens of thousands of documents he had no right to have access to. And most recently, we see OPM fails to protect mm -hmm. the personal information of more than four million employees uh, who have, like myself, who have uh, security clearances, and 20 million, another breach of 20 million, um, who had gone through background investigations, mm -hmm. like leaders of, in, the, in the private sector um, who do business with the government. And so we just never seem to get ahead of it. We're always behind it. We're always chasing it. Look. There's a lot of attention been paid to the, the issue of cyber, but we've not done enough to protect our own systems. Um, frankly, this is an area where I think we ought to recognize from inside the government the greatest treasure, the greatest expertise in this country exists in the private sector. Mm -hmm. There is no area where the government more needs a partnership with the private sector, um, and we ought to devote real resources to it. Um, and get the help of the private sector, first and foremost, to protect our systems and to protect the information that's so vital to national security. Going to that a little bit, and obviously touches on the subject of public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. which is what Concordia is about. Um, first, I want to ask you on, on, on the Sony front, are they not putting enough money in to protect their systems? Are they not taking the right steps? Is the government not proactive enough working with Sony to help them protect themselves from an attack like this? What's there's obviously an issue. What do you see as the first step towards a solution? Well, look, it, it's, I, I think we've got to be careful about criticizing the private sector be, when we know very well that the public sector, mm -hmm. OPM in particular, has been themselves derelict in protecting their own systems. I mean, I think, look, all, all these companies, these major companies, hire outside vendors, mm -hmm. build capability of their own, and do. Believe me, Sony had no interest in seeing this happen to them and have somebody in their network. The problem is, once somebody, once a bad actor is inside your system, it is very difficult mm -hmm. to spot. Not impossible, with enough resources. I think what you're going to see is an increase across public companies. I said on a number of public boards, 
a dramatic increase in the spending against this problem, mm -hmm. this vulnerability. Um, nobody wants to be embarrassed, but frankly, it goes to the trust with your consumer. And so there's a lot of very good business reasons that you're going to see an increase in spending. I do think that the private sector, for that reason, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders and customers, will be ahead of the government. Mm -hmm. Um, they will they will build or access the capability that they need to get to to stay in business and be effective, and so that's why I say the private sector will come with more experience at how the various options to address these problems, um, and I think that the government ought to try to partner with them to learn from their experience. So expand upon that a little bit. The value of public private partnerships in national security. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? So it, it you know. It crosses almost every, every aspect of how the government works that you can imagine. Look, big multinational companies have to procure things, have to buy things. Could they help in, in addressing procurement reform throughout the government in the Department of Defense? Sure they could. Mm -hmm. um, they're in the supply chain. When FEMA's got to get a blue tarp from point A to point B in a crisis, do you think Walmart and Home Depot don't have international supply chains? that are better than the governments and that we could learn from? Sure we could. And so from cyber, from something sort of as high tech as cyber mm -hmm. to something as low tech as supply chain mm -hmm. uh, you know, or procurement, across all of that, we need more exchange where people come in, mid-level executives come into the government and, and do time. And people in the government go into mid-level management positions in the private sector where there's that free exchange of information so we can understand each other's problems and help by virtue of our experiences to solve those problems. And there's just not enough of that. We do, we have a fair exchange between the government and, the, and academia. Mm -hmm. And so we have professors come in for a period of time and then go back and that's very useful. We need to increase that though with the private sector. Well, Fran, thank you very much for participating in our new conversation series. Great. Uh, you're the second, just behind President Alvaro Uribe of Colombia. Uh, it's an honor to have you uh, here and on our Leadership Council, so thank you. Great to be with you.